Welcome to the Valve and Process Solutions Visionaries podcast, where we meet some of the most fascinating folk involved in the development and implementation of valves, actuators, and other engineering solutions. Today's episode features Valve and Process Solutions' very own Steve Pearson. Hope you enjoy it. Okay, so Steve, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast today. How are you doing? Very good, thanks, Jamie. How are you? Really well, thank you. So given that we're putting out the Valve and uh, Process Solutions Visionaries podcast, and we're interviewing interesting people, doing innovative things, it kind of did make sense to get you on the podcast to stick the microphone in front of you <laughs> today. So I thought I'd start, if I, if I could, Steve, by um, by talking about what makes the business different. So I know that uh, all over the website, all over your materials, you talk about educating customers and supporting the industry as a whole. And you've also talked about not finding customers for products, but actually finding the right solutions for for people who come to you. So how does that work in practice? Um, It's a good question, really. I think from uh, from the early days of setting the company up, um, even in the name Valve and Process Solutions, we didn't really want to just be um, another Valve company. Um, My background particularly was from uh, companies that um, provided valves, but very much had big warehouses full of lots and lots of valves, and a customer would ring up for um, a particular product, and we'd we'd choose the product off the shelf, and we'd ship it to them. When we set the company up 13 years ago, I think we realised that there was a... um, a gap in the market because the, the the technical knowledge and the ability to look at a process and look at a customer problem and actually provide a solution for it, be it with a valve or another particular item, was was starting to disappear. Um, a lot of the engineering expertise was being lost in both customers and in suppliers. So we set Valve and Process Solutions up really um, in the early days to, to fill that gap. And we've always really tried to stay true to that. So when a customer rings us up, we don't first off particularly think what we've got on the shelf to sell them. We actually try to talk to the customer, understand um, what the application is, what the problems are that the customer's facing, what the um, you know the ups and downs are from that particular application. We then kind of draw on our knowledge bank, um, and I think between the team now we've got something like over 150 years worth of valve and engineering experience, and we try to draw on that and actually come up with a solution for the customer to solve the problem. Yes. Sometimes that is great and it leads to a product that we have got on the shelf because we got, you know, we work with a lot of world-class manufacturers. We've got those products on the shelf and, you know, probably 60-70% of the time we have a product that will fulfill an application problem. Yes. But we don't kind of tie ourselves to that. We try to think outside the box a little bit and if we think there's something else that would do the job better, we will go out and source that for the customer. If we think we can combine uh, products from a couple of different manufacturers maybe to make a solution, we will do that. So a lot of companies are just rigid. You know, if you go into Audi, for instance, you can't buy a BMW. If you go into BMW, you can't buy an Audi. We're very much like, what does the customer really need? And let's see if we can tailor a solution to that. Hopefully, we've got something in our stock or in our um, you know repertoire that will solve it. But if not, it doesn't limit us to thinking you know, to, to solve that problem for them. Yes, grand. And you've got the expertise there within um, your staff. Very within much so, team. yeah. Yeah, great. And so... Uh, I know a specific example at the moment that you're you're thinking a lot about is helping people to think beyond product but also to spares so can, can you tell me more about that yeah very much so i think um you know the, the environment we're in at the moment is people are wanting to run plants for longer they're wanting less downtime um they're not wanting to hold as much spares on on the shelf um they're wanting um, suppliers like ourselves to hold more spares and and that's absolutely fine we we can we can try accommodate that wherever we can i think the problem we have sometimes is that we do various different products and, and I'll mention one which is the shuff valve predominantly the, uh, the what we call the bottom outlet valve for vessels and reactors and these valves are bespoke um, they're designed specifically for an application the dimensions are specifically for the vessel that they're going to fit and we get a lot of customers who will buy that valve and it's an absolutely fantastic valve it's fit for purpose it solves a problem for the customer and they're very, very good valves, so they tend to last a very long time. Yes. So what tends to happen is the customer actually uses that valve and they'll get a long life out of it, maybe seven, eight, nine years. 
and they've never really had to touch it or look after it. The problem we face sometimes is that then that valve will fall over. You know, it's a bit like a car. You can't drive your car around for, you know, 600,000 miles without changing the tyres or servicing. No. So we have a particular issue where that valve will be run till failure. They pull the valve out to have a look what's wrong with it. They find out, obviously, there's an issue. It may be, you know, a soft seal that's gone in the valve or a metallic part Mm -hmm. or something like that. They then give us a call and they'll say, we've got such and such a valve out in the warehouse. Um, It may be a glass line valve and there's a crack in the lining or or something similar to that. Could you send us some spares for next week so we can replace them and put the valve back into service? Unfortunately, we have to say, I'm really, really sorry, that valve is bespoke. and We have to get the serial number of the valve. We have to go to the manufacturer and find out what the spares are. And typically, a new valve to replace it would maybe be on about 18 to 20 weeks delivery. And the spares, a lot of the, the critical spares, could be on maybe 11 or 12 weeks. Right. And it's not really something we can hold one spare for every valve as we do with a commodity valve because the bespoke, the spares are bespoke to that valve as well. So one of the things we're going to try to do over the next couple of months is try to get in touch with all those companies that we know have got shuff valves on site and basically try to talk to them about the valves, maybe see if we can gather some information about serial numbers and things like that, and then maybe help them to put a plan together of what spares they may need to hold, what spares are common between valves that they've got on site, and and just really help them and, and educate them about the product they've got. And I think the way the industry is moving i think asset ownership and and looking after the valves is nearly as important now as what putting the right valve into the application at, at the first instance and these valves if they are looked after we've got typical instances on certain chemical and pharmaceutical plants where the valves have been in service 28 29 30 years but they need to be maintained on a regular yes. basis and i think because they're a good valve and they don't fall over very often i think that's a little bit overlooked sometimes and the valve is is probably run in service a lot longer than it should be without a bit of care and attention to yeah. it so that's one of the things we're pushing at the moment and again that's just us working with the with the customers trying to educate them trying to help a little bit with the knowledge about the product and sometimes these valves were put in 7 8 years ago and the engineer that's looking after them now had no dealings with when the valve was put in, in the no. first instance and doesn't some people don't even know they've got these valves um, you know, on site and they're that, that critical to the process. So it's really trying to educate people and help them in that instance. Right, yes. And that care and attention, looking after the valves, that uh, are incredibly resilient, but they, they need to be looked after. As you say, you made a comparison with uh, looking after your car and, and so on. The sort of what if, if you don't uh, look after uh, a valve and, and if it were to fall over, as you say, um, and then... You've got a long lead time for, for, for people in terms of availability yes. after that. That could be incredibly damaging for industry, for businesses. So it's well worth doing. Yeah, very much so. And as I say, it's just it's just trying to educate customers that this is slightly different to the normal valves yes. they would have on the, set, uh, on the shelf um, and that we need to put some plan in place to look after these products um, yeah. with them. Grand. Okay, super. Well, thanks for that, Steve. And I know that um, you've talked about uh, the length that the business has been operating, um, but what a transformation, what a what a, a amazing journey that you've had over the last uh, last year or so, um, doubling turnover and so on. And I also know that 18 months ago you weren't expanding, uh, you weren't exporting um, anywhere. Um, now uh, it's a list of um, into, into double figures. To, to to whom you're expa- uh, exporting. Yeah. So how's that come across? Uh, come about? Um, I think there's quite a few things really. I think probably when you when you're quite a smaller company, I think um, you know me as a as an owner of the company or a managing director of the company, you're very much involved with the day to day running. You're doing quotes, you're doing invoices, you're doing that kind of thing. And I think when you're that in that role, it, it's very difficult sometimes to kind of put your head up and and look above the parapet and yeah. see what else is going on out there. You know, it's great cutting down all the wood in the forest, but sometimes you need to look up to make sure you're in the right forest. <laughs> and I think we did suffer from that a little bit, probably in in the early years. And I think obviously as we brought more team members on on board, and we've got people who are taking ownership and and you know moving the business forward, it's allowed me to pull away a little bit and look maybe more at what direction we're going in and, and what we're doing. Um, I think the export side of things has has come particularly now, um, you know, the world's a much smaller place than it used to be. 
I think people can find products easier. I think they've managed to find us easier. Even now, you know, when we set up 13 years ago to find companies on the internet and what products they did and things like that was, it was quite a chore really. Yeah. Whereas now it's kind of, you know, the click of a button. Um, I think the other businesses that we've developed with um, Valve Express and Switchbox Express, which are our online businesses, that creates um, a much easier way of people finding out about products and finding out about us. So from one point of view, I think it's very easy now for customers to find where to get product from. The second thing is, as we've developed over the years, we've started to invest in stock. We're going back to being what I class as a traditional stockist distributor. Over the years, people have wanted to hold less and less stock because it's a lot of money on the shelf, and we're going the other way now and holding more and more stock. And I think that gap between sort of where we sit, you've got the manufacturer and you've got the customer. There's a lot of customers that over the last few years have tried, well, we'll try and cut the distributor out and we'll try deal direct with the manufacturer. And the manufacturer thinks, well, it'd be nice not to have the distributor and we'll deal with the customer direct. And I think that works okay for a certain period of time. But then the manufacturer suddenly realises, we've got somebody ringing us every week for one valve or two valves. We really want to make an order for 100 valves or 200 yeah. valves. And then you've got the customer thinking, every time we ring the manufacturer, they've never got any stock. It's eight, ten weeks delivery. And they don't really seem that interested in us for one valve. They want us to place an order. So... I think that understanding of what a distributor does is starting to come back in vogue a little bit and, and we fill that niche very, very well. Yeah. But we have to back that up. We have to have the technical knowledge to support the customer and we have to have the product on the shelf. So majority of our customers could buy direct from the manufacturers and deal with the manufacturers, but typically it's on manufacturing lead times. We tend to have the stock, we tend to have the price and we tend to have the technical knowledge to help them out of what they need yeah. or maybe even help them with a slightly more... Um, high spec product that will actually move their process on and, and make them more efficient or yes. make them more cost effective because all, all these businesses we are helping you know they need to be productive they need to be um, making profit otherwise they're going to struggle yeah so and that's from, in your best interest isn't it very much so so i think that was happening very much in the uk but i think now you've got all these other companies around the the world that are either distributors like us some are a little bit bigger than us some are a little bit smaller than us but because we've got so much stock they know they can ring us they know they're going to get the right answer they know we've more or less got the product on the shelf we they know we're going to deliver it when we say we're going to deliver it and and those three things you know and a little bit of added value we can give them with you know do you need a mounting kit for it? Do you need an actuator to go with that? Yeah. So I think we fill, fill in a gap that's probably been overlooked for a little bit of time and it's it's paying dividends. And obviously these companies around the world now are, are starting to see what we can do. They put us to the test and, and you know, touch wood. When we, uh, you know, when we look after a customer very well in the first instance, they are coming back to us time and time again. So uh, that's allowed us now. I think we're, we're up to exporting to about 28 countries now, which is, you know, pretty impressive. And it's, it's testament to the team that we've got, yes. you know, they're servicing it, they're looking after it, you know, and uh, I can uh, pull away a little bit and let them get on with it. <laughs> Grand. Well, uh, well, congratulations. That's absolutely fab- fabulous. Thank you. And when uh, when you're not uh, when you're not here in, in work, you uh, you have some interesting hobbies, pastimes, and so on. Um, what do you love doing? Um, I've got quite a few interests, really. I mean, my, my, my biggest passion is obviously my family and, and spending time with my family and my two young girls and my wife is, is you know, kind of the cornerstone of everything. That's that's my why, as it were. Yeah. So that's the thing that keeps it going for me. Um, but I, I like quite a lot of other things. I like a nice glass of red wine now and again. Um, I like to keep fit. I like doing um, various bits of exercise. So I like things like hit workouts. Yeah, um, that's high-intensity training. Yeah, yeah. high-intensity training. Um, I tend to move more towards that with having the family. I've only got short periods yeah. of time to fit things in so I enjoy doing that um, I enjoy running um, done a few marathons and uh, well I did the London Marathon done a few half marathons over the years and I've, I've recently started um, training with martial arts which uh, was a new thing for me a couple of months ago and it's uh, it's proven interesting. It's taken me out of my comfort zone a little bit. Yeah. Um, man grappling, as my wife calls <laughs> right. it. Um, so that's something new. It's a new skill. It's 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 something new to try. Um, and um, and I'm and I'm enjoying working as well. I'm enjoying I'm enjoying business. I'm enjoying learning more about business um, rather than just learning about valves and what valves do. I've managed to pull away from that a little bit now. The team I've got is absolutely fantastic, and they're managing to to run the business for me. 
and now I'm starting to look at other avenues. Um, we've got another company that's going to be coming online very shortly, which is Valve Academy, yes. which we've not really said much about at the moment. But this is really going to be trying to get a company that can actually deliver world-class Valve training. Yeah. And actually what I'm keen to do is try drive that forward and actually try develop a qualification for the Valve industry. And I feel it's something that's really lacking. I know we talked about this before, but, yeah. you know, if you wanted somebody, a plumber to come and service your boiler, they need to be Corgi registered. Yes. But we can have people in the office maybe sizing control valves for a particular hazardous application or a, um, an oil refinery or nuclear power plant. And there's no real qualification within the industry that differentiates one candidate from another. Um, so we're looking to develop a, um, a company that can put that training in place and, and take that forward. So you'll hopefully be hearing quite a bit more about that in the near future as well. Watch this space. Watch this space, as that's they say. Be fa- fa- fascinating. Great stuff. Well, Steve, that's been great. Really enjoyed um, catching up with you. Really enjoyed this, this chat for the podcast. Um, I know that we've got a whole range of interesting guests lined up and that you're particularly interested in um, the history of innovation within the industry and some of the personalities as well within the industry. Some, there are some fascinating things that have gone there on. There certainly <laughs> are. Yeah, I think, um, I think one of my things is, is kind of, you know, the valve industry has been very good to me over the years. I've, I've had a very good living out of it. And one of the things that I used to always love as a, as a young guy coming into the valve industry was, was the old timers, kind of the stories that they were telling and, yes. you know, the applications that they saw problems for or the particular interesting customers they had and things like that and 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 my worry really is that that kind of um, you know information and storytelling and is is getting lost a little bit these these older you know um, people are starting to retire now a lot of the knowledge is getting lost from the industry but also the, the stories and and why things were came about and how they came about and you know what this valve did and what that valve did and things like that so you know obviously uh, working with yourselves one of the things we've we've tried to do is, is introduce this podcast um, or series of podcasts which is you know it's quite new to the industry whether whether it'll catch on, I'm not quite sure. But it's for me personally, it's a great way to capture these stories um, and be able to share them, not only with people in the industry at the moment, but you know, new people that come into the industry over the next, you know, five, ten, fifteen, twenty years, because if we don't write these stories down or record them, they're, they're just going to be lost. Yeah. And, and people won't know why a, an actuator was developed in that particular way or why a valve was fire safe or how the first lift plug valve was invented 100 years ago. You know, and, and from my personal point of view, I, I do think it's interesting and I think it's, it's a way that we can try to capture that. So we'll give it a go and see how we get on with it, I think. Brilliant. So you're going to find some fascinating facts about the industry in the podcast to come. Um, Steve, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to doing this and uh, talking with some of these interesting personalities and, uh, of course, uh, getting to grips with how things have come to be. Very it's going to be so. brilliant. Very much so. Thanks so much for, uh, for, for the chat today. No, thank you. Thanks, Jamie. You've been listening to the Valve and Process Solutions Visionaries podcast, produced and presented by me, Jamie Veach, on behalf of Valve and Process Solutions. Today's episode featured a chat with Steve Pearson, founder and MD of Valve and Process Solutions. And remember, advice doesn't come in a box, it comes from Valve and Process Solutions. So if you want to challenge us to solve a problem, whether it's a single valve or an entire process, drop us a line, pick up the phone or visit vandpsolutions.com. We deal with all inquiries and requests for advice on a case-by-case basis so you get the right solution for your application or project. If you've enjoyed this podcast or if there's someone you think we should be interviewing, then let us know. Just drop us an email. Email kim at vntpsolutions.com Thank you for listening.